right, folks, super happy you all are here today. Uh, I'm excited to talk about this topic. And uh, for those of you who have been to one of my talks in the past, this is going to be extremely different to how I usually talk. This is one of those uh, race through a lot of slides really quickly kind of talks, more the, the Lessig style of approach, uh, rather than talk about pictures for a long time. Um, so thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, I am with Percona, and we do open source databases, database monitoring and management. Um, keeping open source open is kind of the mantra that we live by. We take all the open core models that write proprietary features and uh, write an open source version of it and give it away, and then uh, try and figure out how to make money somehow despite all that. And uh, by the way, since we're in the community track, I'm also hiring for head of community. So if you're interested, feel free to let me know. All right, like I said, the race begins, so start the timer. All right, so I grew up in the 80s. Um, I'm now over 40 years old, which to some of you may be a youngin, to others may be like, who's that old fart? And back in the 80s, there were a lot of fun toys that you'd play with. Transformers um, was a really popular one. And so you'd put together your Christmas list. You'd say, ah, oh, I want all the cool ones. Give me all these amazing Transformers. Um, but, you know, not everybody's parents made a ton of money. So sometimes you might get <laughs> something that wasn't quite right. You'd get the GoBot. Just to give you a sense of the difference between the Transformer and the GoBot. The Transformer looks pretty darn cool for the 80s. Imagine you're thinking that thing and you pop open the GoBot and you get this sort of halfway version of it not really getting the job done. Big disappointment. And that brings us back to open source, the topic of, of our talk today, right? When there's success, people try and take that model, use that model, abuse that model, redefine that model to mean whatever they want it to mean so that they can make a dollar. Success brings imitators. Here's another example. Look at Star Wars, again, real popular back in the day, coming back around again. And then look at Turkish Star Wars. You can go Google this up. It's literally uh, stolen music, stolen video from the actual movie compiled into a new movie, right? Just ripping the model off and making something that's not as good. <laughs> and, and sometimes, even the starting point tries to take things a little bit too far, um, right? Could be uh, Jar Jar, could be Lightbend, could go either way. So open source has won, but at the same time, open source is under perhaps more threat than it ever has had, right? Because now it's successful. That means everybody's trying to jump on the bandwagon. And then you get investors coming into it, which puts a whole new level of stress and pain and pressure upon startups that are trying to figure out how to be the next big thing. Um, because now you're not only under your own pressure, you're under the pressure of somebody who's sitting on your board who will fire your CEO if they're not tripling, doubling every single year. Um, it's a lot of pressure to be under. Uh, before I joined Percona, I was at Docker. We felt that kind of pressure every single day. And they're seeing all the traction happening, right? They're seeing the downloads growing, the active users, the engagement statistics uh, doubling, growing multiple percents on a weekly basis. Uh, they see that traction happening and they say, wow, there's going to be something amazing we could do with this. If we can just put in $30 million, it'll be amazing. And we can somehow monetize, right? Build the adoption and then monetize. That's the new way. But things aren't that easy. There is no build the adoption and then flip the switch and suddenly you're making millions of dollars. Um, or at least not one that works for everybody who cares. There is one that works for the investor. Um, there's not always one that works for everybody else who's part of people who care. And finally, our users don't care about our investors. They don't care about our company. Right? They care about themselves and their needs. Right? They're grabbing Legos. I use the analogy all the time of, you know, users are looking for like a, a Lego castle and they want to grab it, have the instruction booklet, switch, rip, replace to do whatever they want to do with it. And they're cobbling that together into a solution that meets their needs. And they also like variety. 
Um, I used to work at a company called uh, Red Monk, and my uh, a co-founder there, James Governor, said, technology is a fashion industry. It is not about solving your problems. Uh, it is about trend-driven development. It is about conference-driven uh, development. <laughs> Any of you who've put together a talk on a deadline without knowing what that talk was going to be about, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and, and people show up because they're looking for what's new. Right? We're now spending a lot of time talking about Kubernetes. Um, our own product even builds upon Kubernetes. Um, but the commercial market is a big question. The excitement is real. There's thousands of people, even more than 10,000 people showed up at, I think, the 2019 KubeCon. Might be that high again this fall. We'll see. Um, but people are always moving on to the next big thing. Right? Before Kubernetes, there was Mesos. Before Mesos, there was Docker. Before Docker, there was OpenStack. Before OpenStack, there was Eucalyptus. You can keep going back and back and back and people are jumping onto the new thing. There's always something different. And like I said, people get excited by the new things, they hop onto it, they try it. Um, they, I mentioned conference-driven development, but there's also resume-driven development. People are trying to build out the new technology on their resume, so they've got some shiny new object on there, makes them more attractive for new job prospects. Right, so people, intrinsically are, are scratching their own itch, right? That's the open source way, but it's also just the way people live their lives. They're building on their own incentives. They don't care about the company. They don't care about the investors. And so then we have to figure out, now what? Well, if, if that doesn't work, if we can't get people using our product, uh, making a billion dollars, how about a trillion? How can we turn this from a product play into a platform play? How can you build a monopoly that people cannot resist, that they have to have? And so going back to that Lego metaphor, right? how can you not be selling the bricks, but sell the base plate? Everybody's got to have a base plate. You can't build a cool Lego project without the base plate. And so everybody now wants to have their technology, their startup, become the new base plate. Right? We're talking about all the different infrastructure, all the different platforms. Everybody uses platform all the time. Um, our product has the word platform in it. It means something completely different than your product that has the word platform in it. And so infrastructure has become increasingly that battleground. We're seeing these new trends come along, these new platforms come along on what feels like an almost weekly basis. And yet, how do we make a business out of that, and how do we do so in a way that, that respects everybody involved? Well, we've been iterating on open source business models. Uh, let's see, I'm looking for somebody who's going to hate that term. There you go. <laughs> we've been looking at ways to make a business that uses open source software for quite some time. And we started with the classic services model. All right, you figure out, oh, I can uh, make some open source software, we'll kind of give it away as a charity, build some adoption and we'll sell some support, sell some services, right? That's what a lot of the earliest open source businesses built around. Um, the challenge is that services models are very high churn, right? People just jump ship to another service provider. It's, uh, it's a commodity, um, and so it makes it really hard to build a successful growing business, right? If you're trying to build the next big thing, it's hard to do that when you're losing 20% of your customers every, day, every year, when your starting point is taking a few steps back from where you ended up and you have to have new sales replace all those lost customers every single time. So then, people thought up this great idea. How about, how about open core? How can we have an open source product, or at least something that was called open source, but then we build on top of it to add, add something? Um, and that something typically turned into enterprise features, for whatever that term means. All right, everything that any company running at a significant scale needs. Um, you throw that into your proprietary add-on layer. It's like single sign-on, it's audit logging, it's regulatory compliance, it's all those sorts of things that the CIO says they need. Um, and that, that had some success, but it also generated a lot of frustration in the community. Because to do that as a company, a lot of times what, what uh, some venture-funded startup might do is say, oh well, we're going to put a lot of the features that you actually need to run it in production only in the proprietary set, right? which is really annoying. So that means that the free open source project now has a lot less value. You can't do much with it anymore because it's only a toy. It's only suitable for experiments. 
Um, and that, at that point, what do you get? Another model as a service, right? And this is the one that's become increasingly popular over the past, I'll call it decade or so, right? The rise of cloud. Um, you got database as a service, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service. Um, and you can see that there's, there's real value being delivered. And so this is one that works especially for companies that are targeting developers or technologists. You deliver it in an as a service model and people can perceive that you're, cre you're doing work on their behalf. Uh, and so they feel much more comfortable paying for it. Um, one of the downsides, though, is that as a user, you give up a lot of control. Um, and there's a lot of pieces behind the scenes that aren't open source. Right? I mean, this is, as an example, take a look at how Amazon might create a product, right? There's an open source project at the core that they've adopted and, and hosted. Uh, but what about all the management tooling behind it? What about all the automation, all the integrations? Um, those, in many cases, are not open source anymore. And so you can't take the open source project and host it yourself. Right? There is no way to take that out and run your own options. So it's, it's lost part of, part of the value of an open source project being, I can take that thing, I can stand it up myself and do stuff with it. It depends. Good question, right? Where does open core end? Does open core end at everything you need? And then that's, that's where we started to get into um, some of the longer term questions about something like SSPL as an example, right? Because then it does feel open core-ish in that sense of forcing you to open source everything needed to operate. Um, and then there's, there's another model, and this is one that um, we're experimenting with, and it's, it's starting to emerge. It's, Kind of an interesting one, I think, which is if you if we look at the SRE trend, a lot of the conversations in that space about, are about toil. Um, how do we make toil go away? How do we make that busy work of every day I have to do these things stop happening? Um, and so, well, what if we could provide um, enhancements to people's productivity um, and take away some of that toil, automate some of those daily jobs, automate checklists, that kind of thing, uh, to make that go away? Um, and, and this is, in a way, an extension of the as-a-service model to bring that to anybody anywhere they're operating. You can do that on-premises too. Um, so, do you have an for that? Uh, yes, but I don't want to pitch you right now. <laughs> Let's, uh, Percona platform is our product. That's one of the things we do. And um, in, in short, how we do it is we deliver um, a lot of the automation as a service through APIs um, to wherever people are running their stuff. Um, so if, if we take a look at, is, are these models working? Um, is this successful? And we look, at, um, we look at the company names and we look at the financials. It, it's looking successful for the companies involved, right? Lots of IPOs, lots of funding, um, recent kind of down market aside. All right, there's been a lot of good stuff going on. And yet, things aren't working quite as well as they appear to be working as you start looking deeper. If you take a look through some of the financials of a lot of these companies building upon open source, uh, they don't look so great, right? Because every one of them is losing money. In many cases, quite a bit of money. Um, I'm not going to read through all the numbers here, but you can see even the most popular ones out there are losing massive amounts of money on a quarterly basis. Um, if you summarize that, you can pull out some of the public financials and start uh, taking a look through them. You'll see that losing money is the way businesses tend to work today. And yet, that's become accepted by the market as normal and healthy. This works when you're venture funded because you've got money to lose. Um, it doesn't work if you're bootstrapped or customer funded because the money's not there. The money only comes in when you create value for a customer. It doesn't show up when uh, you've got somebody on the other side talking about traction and exponential growth curves and triple doubles. Yeah? Uh, doesn't this kind of prove that everything old is new again? Because to some degree, this is like the junk bond uh, funding of the uh, 80s and 90s. Yeah. It's always, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And a lot of these come back to companies focused on 
um, going public, generating money, returning investor funded dollars, talking about shareholder value, um, and, and talking about it getting there eventually. Right? Eventually, we'll flip the switch, we'll start to profit. And what, is, what does that eventually mean? Right? And it all started, not, not in a bad way, not in a bad way, but really with Amazon making this the popular model. Right? It's not about evil, but it's about companies that show long-term growth trends without making any money. Um, often it's because they are investing all of those potential profit dollars back into capital spend, back into new data centers, back into new software development, whatever else it might be. Uh, but when you look at the financials, they're aiming to avoid making money. They're aiming to optimize for growth. When does it end? When do you stop growing and say, oh, now it's okay to make profit? Uh, why aren't you profiting all along? And while you're doing that, in many cases, you're still optimizing for your investors, or you're op optimizing for your owners, or you're optimizing for your executives. Um, and you're doing so while not respecting your community and your users enough not thinking about your stakeholders instead of your shareholders. Um, and getting to profit is hard, right? If you look at all those success stories, um, none of them are profiting. Getting to profit is hard. Um, and it's very hard when your incentives are almost set up the opposite, right? They're set up to optimize for traction and growth um, rather than for profit. Right? If you take a look at companies using open source. Most of them don't want to pay, right? It's a challenge with the freemium style of business model is that you have to accept the vast majority of your users are never going to give you a dollar. Um, in fact, two thirds is um, even on the low end of what you might see in a lot of companies, right? You might expect for a freemium model that 90%, uh, 95% of your users do not pay you a dollar. Um, and it's, you got to figure out how do you monetize around that last five. Um, so what does success look like? And for people who are building a community or building an open source project, that success does not look the same for you as it does for your investors. If you think back to the first open source project you got involved in, um, why did you start? Why did you begin? Um, most people got started for scratching an itch, solving their own needs. Um, and they might have stuck around for the joy of it. Um, I spent uh, almost 15 years working on an open source project, and in the end, I didn't stick around because of the technology, I stuck around for the people. Um, it was the relationships I built along the way. But if you're at a company making money around open source software somehow, um, do you still have that love? Do you still have that joy? Do you still care about your community? and the people you work with and collaborate with in the same way? Or are you so busy focused on the growth and the investors that you're not focusing on the users um, and building those relationships and building that caring? And a lot of this, again, is, is driven by the pressure coming from people who are providing the money to generate that non-profitable growth. Yeah. Uh, monetizing at different levels, what do you feel you meant by that? Yeah, so, so the question was monetizing at different levels, what, what do you feel you meant by that? Um, that is, I'll call it the, the web company model, is one of those approaches, right? Of like, you're Google, you're monetizing around search ads, um, you're not monetizing around Kubernetes, um, at least until recently, right? Um, but the old school web company model or LinkedIn and the open source projects they're working on. Um, they're not monetizing anything to do with the technology. It's a completely different product offering. Um, and at the time, it was, it was a lot of because of that freemium model. And that freemium model gets even more tilted with open source software than it does with uh, something like an Atlassian, for example. Right? You might have, instead of uh, 5 out of 100 users pay you, you might have 5 out of 1,000. Um, and that's hard to make money around. Um, and open source in many cases is, is I don't want to say becoming 
uh, trivialized, but the, the definition and the value of it are being pushed to and beyond their limits. Uh, it's being used as a specific strategy, which has its merits, um, but it's then being taken and stretched to a point where um, the open source project itself has very little value. It has no standalone value in itself anymore. Right? You say, oh, we've open sourced our SDK. What, if, what am I going to do with that? Right? I can't do anything with your SDK besides use your proprietary cloud-hosted software. Um, it's not a valuable open source project in that way. It's a marketing device. Um, open sourcing your database drivers uh, for different languages. Um, they only work with your database. Like, that's not the right use of open source. That's, that's abusing open source if the database or if the core itself is not also open. Um, and also provides value running it in a production context or for real work. Um, otherwise, you're using it and abusing it. Um, and at the same time, we've got companies that need to develop something sticky. Um, and so it can't just be, oh, use this open source commoditized thing, use this platform that works with everything. Um, because companies are trying to generate business, generate revenue, um, not have to resell the same customers all, all, all the time. And that drives them toward lock-in. Um, how do you create lock-in? How do you get people to stick with you by making it hard to leave? Um, and doing so through technology um, rather than doing so through community and relationships. Um, and so I'm not going to walk through this whole quote, uh, but here's an example of stickiness through database vendors because it's hard to migrate away. It's hard to switch. Um, the harder to switch it is, the stickier it gets, but not for a good reason. The customer doesn't want to stay with you. They're forced to because you've raised the barrier so much to exiting. Um, that doesn't generate a happy customer. That generates a pissed off customer who's looking for an excuse to walk away, um, and it, it leaves you to monetize through things like doing software audits. Um, and so, over time, things keep changing of how do we try and make money around open source software. All right, we see these generational shifts of uh, you try and force things to stay open, people shift the way they're delivering the product, you try and force them to stay open, people shift the way they deliver product, it kind of iterates over and over and over where the license is trying to chase after um, a way to force the code to stay open. Um, and our, our latest point is the SSPL and similar variants, right, which go after trying to force you um, actually trying to force you to do nothing because you're so confused about what it's even asking of you. <coughs> uh, and so what, what can you do with uh, um, Elastic Search Cloud Service today? What if you, if you open sourced all of your management tooling, could you offer that? Can you answer that question? Can your lawyer answer that question? Not easy. Yeah, not easy. Um, and so I, you know, I called it as a service offering is hard or impossible. Um, depending on your legal team and how you interpret stuff. Because uh, if you read through some of the clauses in something like the SSPL, uh, they arguably force you to open source all the way down to your infrastructure software um, and beyond. Like, what about your hypervisor? Um, you got to open source that. What if you bought that stuff from a vendor? What if you're running on somebody else's cloud? Can you offer that as a service? Um, lots of questions. What if you're integrating with an SSO provider like Active Directory? Can you open source that? Um, right? You, you end up in a very sticky point. Um, and yet, at the same time, the SSPL is starting to become outdated. Um, and it's doing so because everybody else is moving to the cloud now. Um, and so as an investor or as a startup, you're thinking, I'm going to offer my service as a cloud. Um, and I might not even have an open source version of it at all anymore. It's just accessible through an API. So therefore, I don't need open source. I don't need the SSPL. Um, but let's go back again to our users. Because um, this is, I think, if you walk away from this thinking one thing, it's people besides the investors matter. Uh, and we have to keep that in mind. Um, and we, in this room, as the community leadership conference, um, have to represent the importance of community uh, back in our own companies. And so when we talk about open source for shareholders, it's very different than open source for um, stakeholders. What does our community want? They want to collaborate. They want freedom. They want to build upon the shoulders of giants so they can easily innovate for their own needs. Um, 
many of those things are exactly at odds with what a startup that's trying to generate revenue wants to happen with its product. They don't want you taking their product and freely innovating by modifying it, changing it, re redistributing your own version of it. Um, they want you to build upon their platform and generate lock-in. Um, they want to have a playing field that's not level, right? So that they have a unique advantage over anybody else offering their version of the software. Um, they want to have a CLA so that all of your ownership or uh, exclu non-exclusive license rights are assigned to them so they can relicense whenever they feel like it. Um, but there's a lot of open source projects out there without a company behind them. <coughs> I uh, did some analysis some time back on, uh, on GitHub projects. Uh, so I've got, a, I've got a question for you. What is the most common number of contributors to an open source project? One. And how often do you think that one person makes a living on that project? And it's yeah, pretty darn close to zero, uh, unless you're the guy who works on curl. <laughs> there, there is an example out there. Uh, and so how do we help everybody generate a sustainable ecosystem around open source? Um, we just saw Tidelift announced the Series C today, maybe yesterday. Um, so there are lots of experiments trying to figure out how do we create a healthy ecosystem that generates people's jobs, generates companies, um, but does so in a way that, that respects our users and helps them solve their problems. And again, going back to the earlier point, users, users don't really care about your company or your business or you need to generate revenue. They care about solving their problems. Um, and so they go through your buffet of all the free things, grab as much as they can eat, and then grab a little bit more. Um, pile it on, go back for seconds and thirds and fourths, um, and suddenly you're losing money and you can't figure out why. Um, right? They do all the things that they're, they're able to do because it's open source, because you can't discriminate against field of use, because you can't limit um, the value that they're able to receive out of it, and they don't feel any obligation to pay you. All right? They're grabbing their Legos, they're doing stuff, um, but some of those Legos are a little defective. Uh, and so you see vulnerabilities come out like Log4j. And then you say, oh, crap, now what? Uh, so we start up some critical initiative and say, oh, now we'll solve it. Well, for one example, two examples, three examples. Um, but getting that to scale is, is hard. Um, and in some cases, we see uh, open source maintainers that get so frustrated with the abuse um, as what they see of, of their trying to generate a community, trying to generate adoption, trying to generate a company around that. Um, that they just kind of say, screw you. Uh, they break their own library, they drop it from a repository, uh, and they, they go their own way. And we see this uh, a number of times in, in the NPM ecosystem, but also in others. And so those kinds of breakages of critical infrastructure um, start to get the government involved, because now that open source is one, we have to figure out how to make it safe and how to make it secure for everybody. And so we see all kinds of uh, executive orders coming in from the U.S. government, as an example. We see all kinds of different government orders from other countries and around the world um, trying to say, here's what you have to do. Um, and we see open source package repositories um, enforcing new restrictions upon their maintainers, um, saying you must now sign your code, for example. You cannot publish anymore unless you've signed your code and signed your release. Um, and every one of those things creates new barriers. Um, and creates new concerns that if we, if we don't self-regulate and do a better job ourselves, we're going to get the government stepping in uh, and forcing us to do things, which is going to be terrible for the community because it's going to chase more people away. Um, and so, so what do we see happening in open source across all these different areas? Um, why is there cause for concern? All right, we're, we're abusing open source projects and open source communities and our users um, in the sake of investor returns. And this is bad for us, this is bad for society, this is bad for our ecosystem. Um, we take people who want to contribute and we say you cannot contribute because that competes with my proprietary feature of my open core offering, as an example. Uh, we're teaching new developers that open source is just a money-making scheme. Uh, it's just a bait-and-switch trick that at some point we're going to take it away from you and say, oh, yeah, the stuff you really need to run this is not open source. Um, or we're going to change the license, or we're going to change the pricing model, right? Like Lightband just the other day. Um, and suddenly, 
you thought you were safe, um, but you're not. How do we defend ourselves? Uh, by, by insisting uh, that we own our own code is one way. By not giving a single company unique rights and privileges to relicense as they see fit. Uh, we have things we can do within our own power to make a difference. Um, we also need to think about new business models, new ways to structure the economics around open source so that we respect all the stakeholders involved, um, not only the shareholders. All right, we need to think about how do we incorporate things like, like sweat equity into the ownership of open source projects and open source communities and companies that build upon them. Um, how do we focus on open source and success as something that is not only about revenue being generated, um, but about community health as a whole um, and about value that's being created for the users of our software. And one of the best ways to do that is to uh, go back and apply for a leadership role at your own company. Get in there, get promoted, uh, start running the place. And you can push the incentives and you can push the metrics in the right way. Um, the other way is, uh, uh, if you've heard of Milton Friedman, he's a well-known economist. Uh, basically screwed all of us over about 50 years ago by saying shareholder value is the only thing that matters. Um, unfortunately, some of that has started to come back around. Um, but it's people like us who need to push for stakeholder value, not only shareholder value. Um, and so, you know, the question comes back to each one of us of, of the choices we're making every day. And what are we going to do about them? Um, are we going to be used and abused? Are we going to take advantage of our own user base? Um, or are we going to reach for the brighter side? Are we going to look for a better, happier place in the world? Um, as idyllic as that sounds, as ridiculous as it might sound, um, we have to do what's right. Um, we have to reinforce that. We have to support others when we see them doing it um, and build that, that upward cycle instead of that downward spiral. So hopefully you enjoyed that. That is all I've got. Thank you. got some time for questions, if anybody has some. Yeah. So open source business model, uh, Stephen Wally has mm -hmm. traditionally argued that there is no business model for open source. I've taken the other side of the spectrum. Where mm -hmm. do you fall on that uh, range? Um, so the question was, where, where do I fall in that range around open source? Steve, Steve Wally, Jeff Bork have both taken different positions on this over the, um, over the years. I see open source as a, a flavor, an implementation of a freemium model in practice. Um, but it's one that also, I mean, I would say almost uniquely incorporates community in a way that most other freemium models cannot. Um, right? It, you, so if you imagine combining freemium with some kind of extensibility model and plug-in model, that is effectively open source. Um, and yet, community makes it, I think, uniquely different. So, somewhere in the middle? Yeah. You're talking about shareholder value. Given the return on investment that is expected, is there a point at which it isn't actually possible to use the open source model to meet those expectations? Um, so, so the question was, yeah, more or less, how do you align um, investor expectations with having open source software at all? Is it even possible? And I think the, the answer to that is uh, it, it certainly is possible, but it requires, um, it requires figuring out the right delivery model and, and doing so in a way that respects your users. I mean, the cloud hosting model is, is probably the most successful one right now um, because people see the value they're being created in it. Um, but, but what do you do when um, you start seeing some traction and then some other larger cloud provider comes along and wants to host your own thing and make more money off of it? Um, that's, that's one of the biggest challenges right now for that approach. Um, there are, there, there's a whole school of, of thought around how do you build kind of differentiation that's sustainable and build some moats around the things that you're doing to keep that from happening effectively. Um, I, I don't think licensing is the right way to do so. I think licensing is, is 
trying to apply some glue after you've already broken the table, more or less. Um, the right approach is more around building a, building a community and making that sticky and using that community and that um, flywheel around things that the community creates and contributes um, to build something that sticks with you. Um, one, I'll just, to, to make that more specific, right, as an example, so I, I said I spent some time at Docker, and one of the biggest reasons Docker was, is sticky is um, the content on Docker Hub, right, the official images, but also the ecosystem of things like partner images and community contributed images keeps it popular, even when a lot of production environments have moved on to Kubernetes. Um, Docker is still the developer tool of choice. Let's see. I'll call on you in a sec. Anybody else before uh, Jeff asks another question? Yeah. I have an online question. Oh, an online Is question. Okay? Great. Um, uh, thanks for this talk. About generating revenue, what do you think about recognizing open source as a new type of digital public good and financing it through public money? to address the free rider problem. For example, add 1% open source tax to all proprietary software sales, similar to value added tax, and distribute the collected money back to the open source ecosystem based on specific usage and importance metrics. Um, super interesting question and, and a thought on how you could approach that. Um, I think that is, that is the kind of model that um, has some potential here in Europe, where people, <laughs> where people care about social safety nets and care about supporting the public good um, and is much less likely to be viable in the United States, uh, where it's more of a everybody is on their own and best of luck to you kind of model. Um, so there's some potential. Thank you. Yeah. yeah it's a great talk, a very thought provoking one. Thank you so much for that. This is a question. Like, you said your company is doing something, but you have not mentioned like how you are bringing in that model. Ah, uh, yeah. So um, I'll just give this as as an example, um, and try and avoid pitching anybody on it. If you feel like I'm pitching, just go ahead and walk out the door. Uh, totally fine with that. Um, so so we do something. Um, it's roughly like a Red Hat for databases is how I think about our business model. Um, but part of that sort of hybrid RoboCop style thing that we do is. Um, we have these things we call advisors that are more or less an automated checklist and remediation tools for all kinds of common scenarios that we learn about based on supporting databases at scale. Um, and so we deliver those um, through, I hesitate to call it SaaS, but kind of like an infrastructure SaaS sort of model where those get downloaded onto a production environment at our customers and users. And they run on a regular basis and check how things are going, um, recommend changes when things aren't going, um, you know, enable some sort of auto remediation for customers and, and users who are willing to accept that kind of thing. Um, and that's an example where if, if you stopped having those tomorrow, um, your production environment would still keep working, but it would take you more work and you'd be more likely to miss stuff all, all along the way. Um, so it's a productivity enhancement and kind of a human augmentation approach. And it's a purely open source software that you are having in this. Um, everything that runs on a production environment is open source. Isn't that in the end the wake and mold scenario you mentioned mm -hmm. because you'll frustrate your customers if you're no longer there? Um, I hope they get frustrated if we're gone. <laughs> Otherwise, we don't have much of a business to build on. Um, but you've, you've got to create value somehow. Um, and I think that how is increasingly, if you want to have a business that grows, um, it's got to be a software business somehow. Um, and so you have to figure out what is the most respectful way to your users and your community of using software to create some kind of a viable company. Um, and I see the as a service model and um, some sort of an augmentation and productivity type of model as, as two of the ways that do that the best um, without taking things away or forcing things to be proprietary. Any other questions? Yeah, in the back. Right. So, so the question was, you know, what are some new business models that jump out, especially for projects that may not be looking for investment and just have a couple of maintainers and are trying to figure out how do I build a, a healthy life around that? Um, 
I mean, the, the tide lift one is one of the more interesting ones that I've seen lately. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of people trying some sort of a sponsor patronage model over time, and it hasn't really worked in a professional way for anybody. Um, nobody's really making a salary that they can live off of with that. Um, and so the, the tide lift one is kind of interesting of trying to take subscription support and then spread it out across different open source projects. Um, it, it does have some interesting incentives around um, if your project gets more bug requests, do you get paid more money? And therefore, should you have like worse software so you, <laughs> um, so you make more? Um, but, but that one is interesting. I think another one, um, you know, even as a small company, you can often figure out some way to offer a hosting model. Um, and so I definitely recommend thinking about how can you take your couple of people and make them a force multiplier, right? So it's not a couple of people doing a couple of support tickets. Um, is that at, at its small, at that kind of scale, it it's doesn't work because you're always getting a phone call in the middle of the night with somebody who has this broken stuff. Um, Percona started as an emergency consulting business back in the day, uh, 16 years ago now, and uh, moved on from that because it wasn't it wasn't viable for the people involved. Um, it also wasn't very predictable. And so, how do you figure out a predictable revenue model, like some kind of a subscription um, that, that creates value for your customers? Um, it avoids locking them in because they don't want to be with you. Um, it, it locks them in because you get extra value that you no longer get if you stop. Um, so I think some sort of hosting um, combined with um, some sort of, I'll call it slow support. Um, there's a, a tool that we use for, uh, that we're experimenting with for community dashboards called Orbit. And if you're an Orbit customer, um, they give you email support after like two days. Right, which is a, extremely viable. It doesn't work for production software. Nobody's going to wait two days to be like, oh, losing nine hundred thousand dollars a minute or something, according to Gartner, and I'm going to wait two days for this. Like, that's that's not viable. Um, that's some of my thoughts. But I think you know, I would love to hear more examples of of smaller communities that have generated a great company around it. Right. Yeah. Um, so how do you feed back into the into the smaller communities and ones that I think might be a dependency of your pro of your yeah, yeah. Um, it's a good question I mean it's the kind of thing where like you would imagine some sort of a solution like micropayments to somehow work um, I, I'm not aware of anywhere where it has worked in practice um, and so you know what is the approach and I think I mean a part of it is is raising the visibility of your project so that people even realize they're building upon you. Like if, if you're, for example, if you're two levels away, nobody knows you exist. Um, you just, you get pulled in as part of some installation process with like 300 different libraries and toolkits and whatever else. Uh, and then you're aligned in somebody's terminal output that they maybe read. Um, and so how do you, how do you raise that visibility? I mean, that's, it's a hard problem, right? Um, you can do it by almost becoming uh, infamous, like a, as a Daniel the Curl guy, becoming your own uh, XKCD comic, uh, having uh, you know, if, and if your core infrastructure every time you have a security vulnerability, like it's terrible, but it's also good mm -hmm. because people now know you exist <laughs> and know you matter and know they need to support you somehow. Um, but it's it's a tough problem. I don't have a good solution for you. <laughs> no. It's <laughs> All right, we're a couple minutes over. Um, Last question. Yeah. Why, why is Red Hat the exception that proves the rule? Why is Red Hat the exception that proves the rule? Is the question. Um, our, and people point to I, I right. Can take, I can take a shot at that if you like. Go for it. Well, I think it was things in the beginning. Oh, that oh. The Offering systems were somewhat neat in that um, certifications, for example, mattered a great deal. So mm -hmm. certainly. One reason that you saw commercial open source. Uh, you've got a mic coming your way. One sec. Okay, the, 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 uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. oh, sorry about that. 
virtual attendees. Yeah, well, certainly one, one of the things was that um, operating systems were somewhat unique because of the need for certifications and so forth at the beginning. And then I think just quite frankly, and by the way, I'm a Red Hat employee. Uh, the, uh, uh, but um, I think as time went on, Red Hat just very much navigated this bringing value to customers and there were all kinds of timing things. and. We're over time, so I will just shut off now. Yeah, so so lots of different reasons for it. Um, one that I, I think I think I heard from was it Brian Stevens some time ago was around um, simplifying the complexity of a massive ecosystem around the Linux distribution. There aren't that many ecosystems that are that complicated where you can create value off simplifying them. Thank you.